Section 14 of Margaret of Angoulême, Queen of Navarre, by Agnes Mary Frances Robinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 10. Changes. 1536 to 1538. On the field of Pavia, Francis had sent his ring to Soliman, the king had established the Collège of France in spite of the Sorbonne. In defiance of the church, he had endowed two chairs of Greek. In founding two professorships of Hebrew, he had taken its reproach and its squalor from the ghetto. The Jews, the learned, these two persecuted and endangered peoples, he had glorified and reassured. In sending his ring to Soliman, francis embraced the last enemy of medieval christendom the turk in the turk francis perceived the one ally that could truly aid him against the emperor venice the enlightened eye of europe already perceived the undue predominance of austria and saw in soliman the natural balance with venice whose trade required the port with england whom the church no more controlled with scotland denmark and the saxon princes france might head a formidable confederation a capital danger to the empire and the inquisition such a league was the dream of the sixteenth century from the battle of pavia in 1525 to the renewed project of spires in 1573 but as a rule the christian princes were as parochial in their hatred of the east as in their yet bitterer hatred of christian heresy the catholic hated the turk and the huguenot the huguenot the catholic and the turk it was the merit of francis to rise above sectarian considerations to propose a great political alliance between the protestant north and catholic venice and catholic france and mohammedan turkey such an alliance would have been the last word the greatest masterpiece of the renaissance humanity tolerance freedom of judgment would have been naturalized thereby in europe and the dreadful history of the seventeenth century might have had a different record but the thing was difficult beyond belief for each state suspected the other and all alike suspected soliman he was reckoned as in their state papers england and spain and germany alike conspired to name him the turk the common enemy. Francis could find it no easy task to make the most enlightened kingdoms of Europe accept his alliance. For great and deep spread the horror of the Turk. Venice was too wise, England too far to share it, save in a nominal and intermittent fashion. But in Germany the dread of Soliman was as natural and fierce as superstition nor was this wholly an unreasonable fear selim was dead and gone and in these later days the ottomans themselves were admirably well disciplined and merciful in fifteen twenty six two hundred thousand turks traversed the empire they marched along the roads avoiding the fields lest they should ruin the harvest not a village was burned not a hamlet plundered any soldier caught in the act of pillage was hung to the trees by the roadside whatsoever his rank or station in fifteen thirty two captain rincon the envoy of francis visited the prodigious camp of soliman thirty miles in extent astonishing order no violence merchants women even coming and going in perfect safety as in a european town life as safe as large and easy as in venice justice so fairly administered that one is tempted to believe the turks are turned christians now and the christians turks the turks themselves were just wise moderate and humane but alas the turkish armies were not all composed of turks the fierce algerian pirates slave dealers kidnappers of boys and women were the allies of soliman the terrible Kair Eden Barbarossa bore the title of Turkish admiral. This should have been the double and exacting task of Francis, to reassure Europe against the Turk, to secure Soliman while excluding Barbarossa. 
the first step on this errand he had taken on the morrow of his capture at pavia when drawing from his finger his last possession he had said to his attendant take this to the sultan the second step was passed in this year fifteen thirty six when on the eve of battle with charles francis signed a secret treaty with soliman the third step the open acknowledgment and precision of that treaty was still to be taken if ever it should be taken the venetians are now all turkish and alienated from the emperor utterly writes harville so late as the spring of fifteen thirty nine and i am of constant opinion that the french state seeketh to perturbate the world in the emperor's detriment indeed while francis and rincon and du Bellay were welding the french treaty with the turk the queen of navarre was as busily employed in seeking to bring england into a french alliance she herself interviewed the english ambassadors and in our collection of foreign state papers her name is at least as frequently quoted as the king's the queen of navarre is a right english woman said francis to sir william paget she is always a member of the king's secret council writes matteo dandolo venetian ambassador in france and therefore is obliged to follow the king wherever he goes though narrow and inconvenient be her lodgings it was a hard life but margaret was happy in this career of active and beneficent devotion in these years of work and counsel her letters are brilliant and contented letters of how different a sort to those inspired by the quietism of her youth from fifteen twenty to fifteen twenty four the unrest and superstition of her age from fifteen forty seven to fifteen forty eight in this year fifteen thirty six while the question of the turco huguenot alliance was filling the secret councils of france war fell out again with the emperor on the old question of the milanese the queen of navarre was now perhaps the busiest woman in france her letters are full of the details of the campaign she encourages her husband and his kinsmen to raise experienced regiments for the war she inspects the troops with her cousin de carmen she goes to suppress a rising of the disaffected basques she and montpeza discover and interrogate a spy and all the time she is investigating the ruined fortunes of isabeau de rohan she is securing the advancement of her old playmate anne de montmorency she is assisting her husband and sounding his trumpet in the ears of francis henry of navarre in his quality of governor of guienne raised an army and led it to the southern frontier margaret's letters to montmorency very frequent at this moment are full of allusions to her young husband to his valour his troops we see in her mind the happy contrast that she makes between this eager service of the brave young king of navarre and the cowardice and failure of the husband of her youth margaret we feel is no less anxious than her brother to wipe out on a fresh field the disgraces of pavia she writes to montmorency i have had news of your soldier the king of navarre he is i fancy on the march for he has determined to depart without going to bayonne for by this time he has the letters in which i told him that the emperor is at hand and that you await him at the camp of avignon i am sure he will not fail you there i pray you my son that you will hold him as a brother for i am sure that you will find his love so good and firm that you will not repent you for having taken him to your heart the preparation for the campaign went on with enthusiasm the army in piedmont met with brilliant success the camp on the frontier was impatient for battle margaret writes to the king my lord i came yesterday evening to this place of montfrain near avignon where is the division of the king of navarre which i have seen in battle array i will say nothing of the men-at-arms but there are few soldiers better mounted than our light horse you will be pleased with the gascons and would to god the emperor would try to cross the rhone while i am here for with the succour you mean to send us and but little is necessary i would gladly undertake on my life mere woman though i be to keep him from passing the emperor did not pass 
his army starved and thirsted on the devastated frontier. Victory attended the arms of the French, but death, the faithful retainer, fought now as ever upon the emperor's side. The war shrank into insignificance beside a blow that, not without suspicion of treason, changed the future of France. For the young Dauphin, Francis, the idol of his father, the heir of the kingdom, suddenly died. He was sailing down the Rhone to join the king in the camp of Valence. He broke his journey at Lyon, and there, one day being overheated from a game of tennis, he sent his page to draw him a cup of water from a well. It is probable the young prince succumbed to a violent pleurisy, but when he died that night in extremity of torture, all France declared that Montecucuy, the Dauphin's cup-bearer, had smeared some Spanish poison of the emperor's upon the edges of the cup. More than mourning and anger were to come of this event. The Dauphin Francis had been in mind as well as in body singularly his father's child. He was of Francis's party, gay, chivalric, gallant, perhaps unstable, liberal, easy. But Henry, the second son, was now the heir. The unusual character of this youth of eighteen made him already remarkable at court. Henry was taciturn, sardonic, melancholy. Says Matteo Dandolo, he seems all nerve, he is so strong and tall, but he is dark, pallid, livid, even green, and it is said he was never seen to laugh a hearty laugh. Still he is in his way a good companion to his own friends, and loves the liveliness of his younger brother. He has a small head, large eyes looking down, thin temples and a narrow forehead. He is brave and loves hunting and fighting. He is very religious and will not ride on Sundays. Another Venetian ambassador adds a stroke or two to the portrait. He is melancholy, saying little, and devoid of repartee, but when once he has said a thing, he holds to it mordicus, for he is very clear and decided as to his opinions. He has a mediocre and rather slow intelligence. He is virtuous and reputable, and spends his money liberally, but wisely. Il est né Saturnien, says Simon Renard, and truly the star of Saturn sheds its singular and pallid radiance upon his course. As a child, his father had not loved him. Je n'aime pas, he had said, les enfants sont géards, surdos et endormi. And dreamy, dull, and sleepy were still the manners of the prince. Four years of his childhood had passed in the Spanish castle where he had been a hostage for the brilliant father who did not love him, and it was his destiny that he should henceforth detest the land of his captivity and make war upon it, while he himself was imbued with the spirit of it, while he himself should turn the volatile, spontaneous, Gaelic character of his father's France into a thing so pallid, as precise, as decorous as the emperor's Spain. Under him, the long reign of the style soutenu begins in art and letters. He is slow, solemn, romantic, and yet conventional. In his long straight nose, his fine anxious brows, his singular large eyes, we see the evidence of a certain ideality, but no power to direct it. A Saturnine, says Simon Renard, and another calls him a king of lead. He is indeed save when in battle or following the hunt, an inert and sombre youth, with his crooked sinister mouth, his black straight hair, his lustreless black eyes. In 1533 the king, anxious to conciliate the papacy, had married Henry to the heiress of Florence and Urbino, the pope's niece, Catherine de' Medici, a plump child of fourteen, with full lips, large eyes, a retreating chin, a certain vulgar prettiness. She had caressing, charming manners that made every one at court in love with her, except her sombre young husband with his solemn air of a Spanish grandee, unapproachable and noble. For him, this little bride during her whole life cherished a devoted passion that was perhaps the only lovable thing in her career. But Henry was at first supremely disgusted with his marriage, her quickness in pastimes, her lively manners, her neat-ankled prettiness could not make him overlook 
the trading ancestry of his bride twenty years later the venetian ambassadors inform us that all the court of france looked down on catherine because she was not of royal blood she can never do them favours enough if she gave away the whole of france they would scarcely thank her because she is a foreigner and she has neither credit nor authority since she is not of royal birth bah it is only the shopkeeper's daughter said madame dion to the little queen of scots more than twenty years after this and indeed though a good enough match for the duke of orleans little catherine de medici not beautiful enough at seventeen was doubtless made to feel herself a very poor alliance for the heir of france they have smirched the valois lilies with a mercantile alliance cried the emperor henry was ashamed of his wife and did not love her as time went on and the plain bourgeoise unlovely girl did not even give him an heir he began to think of a divorce but all the pride and all the real love of catherine's heart arose and pleaded against him with king francis and henry was finally brought to reason by a very great lady with whom he was in love diana of poitiers the widow of the great seneschal of normandy and the daughter of that saint valier who had nearly perished for the conspiracy of bourbon this most important and almost princely personage though she called catherine a daughter of shopkeepers persuaded henry to treat her better and even to reward her with a moderate affection it is wonderful how madame la seneschal has made another man of him says marcus cavalli he used not to love his wife at all but was vain and full of mockery for diana of poitiers had an almost boundless influence over henry she was no longer young at the time when montmorency brought her and henry together in his house of ecouen she was thirty-eight and he not quite eighteen years old every one said that henry would never fall in love but montmorency divined better he determined to attach the young prince to the woman twenty years his senior who was a montmorency's party a catholic among catholics a conservative hating the turco huguenot alliance and hating spain also though filled with the spirit of spain diana was still a very beautiful woman her abundant hair jet black and curly sometimes she dyed it red made a frame for a pallid delicate face beautiful with that peculiar renaissance beauty so illustrious and strange which affects the imagination more strongly than the senses her lids were a little tight over the eyes the small close shutting lips tight also the straight small nose prominent in profile the delicate eyebrows arched and tense above the well-set eyes the forehead round the neck beautiful but slender the whole face secret unemotional unexpressive yet most provoking to the imagination the whiteness of her pale complexion was a special beauty of le grand seneschal in some sort her life was devoted to preserve it every morning she arose at early dawn and bathed herself winter and summer alike with icy water then by the light of the daybreak she went riding through the fields around paris or in the woods of fontainebleau before the world awoke she was at home again reading in her bed till noon then began her regular life of a great lady at court resolved to marry well her little daughters resolved to keep her power as a beauty to make herself a power in politics later on we know that all the secrets of the state were debated in her house at Anay. even then we may be sure no secret of the catholic party was kept from her and as soon as she became the mistress of henry she devoted herself to be his counsellor his adviser giving him wise instruction and even lending him her money catherine seventeen years old plump merry affectionate had not known how to win her husband's love it was different with diana the charm of an elder woman her refined sweetness and delicate superiority were perhaps the only wiles that could have caught the dauphin and diana with the dignity had not the disadvantage of her years hers was not the loveliness that fades with youth her penetrating armida graces were unchanged her grand style her grave and delicate air gained rather than lost by the sparer outlines and paler tints of waning youth 
tall and slender she was ever soberly clad she affected no rivalry with the cloth of gold and gems of younger beauties she wore black and white in honour of her widowhood when the dauphin became her lover she still wore her quiet weeds for her dead husband and he also took for his badge the mourning colours of the man he had supplanted all the dauphin's court assumed the hues of widowhood no one seems to have found it strange diana was so inaccessible so remote and distant that rumour itself could find no fault with her she continued the most pious the most catholic the wisest the most respectable of ladies many said and say that she had conferred on francis the affections that now she bestowed on his son there is no evidence there was no evidence then to what degree the dauphin was her lover though the revolution which desecrated the grave of diana and of her two dead babies in her chapel at anay has settled that question for a later world she has undertaken says cavalli to indoctrinate the dauphin to correct and counsel him and to urge him on toward all actions worthy of him the moon was her emblem the crescent moon with the equivocal device donec totem impleat orbem and if the star of saturn shone fitly on the dauphin's birth for her the natural planet was the pale the solemn the enchanting moon cold narrow-hearted fanatic rather than religious curious rather than impassioned diana was truly a daughter of the moon a moon that stooped to kiss her gloomy young endymion the dauphin fell at once under her enchantment he was then eighteen but when he died twenty-three years later king henry the second was no less devoted it was a possession rather than a passion the amazed courtiers laughed in their sleeves the country people awestruck by her name said that she had enchanted prince henry with a philter they found her in her lunar beauty the image of that pale diana of the forests whom witches hymn by night and they declared that every morning of her life she drank the draught of molten gold this in a sense was true diana knew how to lend and how to give but she knew still better how to grasp her delicate tenacious hands filled themselves with the wealth and the power of france she and montmorency stood one on either side of the melancholy dauphin and whispered their counsels in his ears round them swiftly gathered a strange sad rigid fanatic little court an assembly of the orthodox the pious the bien pensant the centre of all that was romanist and latinist a society illumined by the dubious crescent of diana and dressed all in black and white in honour of her widowhood naturally this new little court gained immensely by the death of the dauphin francis now that henry was the heir his faction became scarce less puissant than his father's it stood in the sharpest contrast to the splendid free-living tolerant court of francis the court for which andrea and leonardo had painted the court which established the college of france which dreamed of the league with luther and with soliman the object of the one party was the expansion of france they would give one hand to the turk and one to the huguenot they would draw from italy from the east from the jews all that could enrich their country but the aim of the younger party was the centralization of france they wished to develop a civilization of their own owing nothing to foreign influences the party of francis gave us rabelais marot the estienne the castles of blois and chambord and fontainebleau the germ of the collections of the louvre and the college of france the party of henry less concerned with ideas and far more delicate in expression enriched the world with ronsard and the pleiade with anne and Ecouen, with the art of francois clouet and his school a delicate precise charming but artificial beauty centres in that court a second renaissance not passionate for truth for knowledge for freedom for humanity like the movement that inspired the life of margaret of angouleme the first consequence of the dauphin's death was immensely to increase 
the prestige of montmorency he was now on the topmost pinnacle of success both margaret and the dauphin had used all their influence in his favour all parties were for him his skilful generalship had made a victorious campaign francis perceiving the grand master to be a keen and ready soldier and being himself influenced by margaret's praises of her friend determined to reward him richly on the disgrace of bourbon the dangerously powerful office of constable of france had fallen into a wise desuetude the king determined to revive it for montmorency margaret never shrewd or suspicious rejoiced in this triumph of her friend the news gave general pleasure at court for the dauphin was montmorency's close ally and queen leonore and madeleine de montmorency were near and zealous companions these were all for the grand master no one else was powerful enough to hazard a remonstrance yes there was one one unlikely and ridiculous cassandra madame d'etampes hearing of the king's determination prayed wept urged implored francis not to give that post to montmorency but for that wise once his pretty anne begged of francis all in vain in the spring of fifteen thirty eight the ceremony took place leading the queen of navarre by the hand montmorency advanced to the steps of the throne francis taking the sword of state from its scabbard placed it bare-bladed in the grand master's hand at that moment the heralds waved their flags and cried vive de montmorency connetable de france the rash deed was done montmorency was now only second to the king in addition to his immense wealth his office of constable brought him an income of twenty four thousand pounds tournois constable grand master minister of finance anne de montmorency had virtually the kingdom at his command he could rise no higher be no greater neither francis nor margaret could aid him more he became henceforward less the servant than the rival of the king chief in the dauphin's rising court counsellor of the outraged queen leonore he scarcely concealed his contempt for the magnificences and frivolities of francis nor his aversion for the lutheran views of margaret no question now of repaying old benefits of requiting a long affection montmorency the harsh frugal inquisitorial and dogmatic constable conscientiously disapproved of nerac and its refugees he felt no scruple in trying to destroy the influence which had helped him to his seat of honour so when the peace was made despite his promises despite the benefactions of margaret montmorency raised no plea for the restoration of navarre the french retained esdin and savoy there was no question of the rights of henri d'albret and one day a little later when king francis complained of the singular growth of heresy sire if you would exterminate it said the constable begin with your court and first of all with your sister the cruel word missed its mark she loves me too much said francis she would never believe other than i believe nor anything that would prejudice my estate the shaft glanced by king francis but it lodged in margaret's heart in this year fifteen thirty eight her frequent letters to the constable come to a sudden end from that day she never liked nor trusted montmorency and for a year and more she sat in vague helplessness watching all her work unravelled by this man watching francis drifting toward the emperor in desertion of his natural allies. End of section fourteen. Section fifteen of Margaret of Angouleme, Queen of Navarre, by Agnes Mary Frances Robinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter eleven. A false step. Fifteen thirty nine to 1540 at this time the emperor's good town of ghent revolted against him and besought the king of france to grant his protection to flanders 
here was a brilliant opportunity for francis by espousing the cause of protestant flanders he would virtually conclude a league between himself and the great schism of northern europe while in defying charles he would give a pledge to soliman this was the dread of montmorency the dear desire of margaret all through the winter of fifteen thirty nine the spring of fifteen forty she was busy with the english ambassadors trying to win her brother to make a league with henry the eighth trying to estrange him from the influence of montmorency but montmorency was all in the ascendant now and the turco huguenot alliance had lost some of its first attraction to the volatile mind of the king francis under montmorency began to think again of milan to wish again for the friendship of charles therefore to the surprise of those who believed themselves his real allies francis refused the offer of flanders he even promised charles a safe passage through france if he chose to go that way to reconquer his dominions no doubt the emperor in return promised many golden things we know that he had sent a messenger to francis earnestly beseeching the right to pass through france and hinting at rewards too great to specify francis believed him and he came came to the bitter disgust of the queen of navarre the evident displeasure of madame d'etampes the fiery indignation of prince henry who remembered those french attendants who accompanying him into captivity had been sent by the emperor to the galleys but francis insisted on a noble reception for his guest a certain chivalry of instinct forbade him to recall the dungeon of madrid so the emperor came to the disgust of france to the bewilderment of the protestants and soliman and venice these men are not a little astonished writes harvel from venice in november fifteen thirty nine to understand of the emperor's journey to flanders by the ways of france with few horses and certainly they are matters of great admiration and exciting the reasons of men to consider so great and perpetual enemies have so great confidence together not only harvel but all europe believed that the emperor afraid of the power of francis should he join the league preferred to grant him milan and keep him as a friend the venetians thinking themselves forsaken were in great distress and bewilderment soliman said these christian princes know not how to keep their word henry of england sent his ambassador to margaret to learn if francis will in truth incline toward the emperor i fear says margaret at easter time in fifteen forty i fear the legate farnese is trying to draw him from king henry to the emperor margaret made as brave resistance as she could never think she cries to wallop my brother will so lightly lose so faithful and assured a friend but in her heart she feels herself powerless to turn the current of her brother's thoughts from milan in february she tells norfolk if you would have anything of importance done seek to win over madame d'etampes who can do more with the king than all the rest only she went on margaret can impress a thing in his head against the constable and i myself when montmorency had turned the king against me i had to seek the help of madame d'etampes this good queen is a faithful friend to your highness writes wallop to henry the eighth but with the cowardice of her tremulous adoration margaret did not dare boldly to oppose the folly of the king she worked on him vaguely and indirectly by chance speeches by the faint contagion of her own convictions and through the influence of madame d'etampes even for that she so firmly thought the right and the best margaret could not openly remonstrate with her brother's weakness these things can only be wrought by madame d'etampes she declares to wallop i will not speak myself i should be noted partial and also suspected and miserable at her own lack of influence she cries with a pathetic denseness my brother is of this sort that a thing being fixed in his head 
it is half impossible to be plucked away. Poor Queen Margaret. She could not believe her brother fickle, much less wrong. In the end of spring she declares to Wallop, the emperor is a good man. But she goes on seeing the truth in one supreme moment of disgust. The king is too light of credence and trusteth things willingly. Not only Margaret now began to see how little worth were the golden promises of the emperor, who having conquered Ghent sent word to Francis that he could not give him Milan without the consent of the German electors. This was a quit for Burgundy, which Francis would not yield without the consent of the notables. By July there was a coolness between the king and the emperor, and Francis again remembered the Protestant Venetian Turkish League. He sent the royal order to the king of Denmark. He sent an embassy to Venice. But the Venetians now began to hate the French, says Harvel. He sent an envoy to the Turks, and for some while offended Soliman would not so much as see the envoy. Francis and Margaret occupied themselves with the making and seasoning of certain wild boar pasties, which they sent to the king of England. But Henry, mindful of the fickleness of Francis, would promise now no help against the emperor. Francis, nevertheless, was determined to redeem his slip. It seemed natural to redeem it at Margaret's expense. In order to reassure the German princes, he offered his niece of Navarre in marriage to the Duke of Cleve, a Protestant at heart and avowedly an enemy of the emperor. Flanders I can get at any time, said Francis, refusing to accept the Netherlands in lieu of Milan, and probably he thought it well to have a friend so near at hand. But the alliance, though good for France, would be disastrous to Navarre. It could do nothing for the poor confiscated little kingdom. It would secure neither France nor Spain, and the future queen would be an absentee living on her husband's German territory. Henry d'Albret deeply resented the betrothal, but he was too feeble to oppose the imperious brother-in-law, whose pensioner in some sort he was, powerless, although the estas of his dominions more than once appealed against this peremptory order of the King of France. It is only at this moment that we fully appreciate the intense and all-absorbing devotion of Margaret to her brother. This whim of his ran counter to every interest of her husband, of her subjects, even of her child. They are all nothing to her. She cannot conceive that they should oppose their will to that of Francis. Even the passionate anger and grief of the little princess did not touch her mother's heart. Jeanne, still ailing, frightened, not yet twelve years old, wept bitterly at the thought of being given to the care of a stranger different in language and manners. Her proud and sore little heart rebelled at leaving France to marry a simple duke, Yet she had been very dull and lonely at Plessis. She filled her chamber with complaints, the air with sighs. One of the fairest princesses of Europe is fading away in tears, her locks hanging loose, undressed, her lips without a smile. And when King Francis heard this thing, he named the lady to the Duke of Cleve without the consent of her father or her mother, declares Olhagare. But it was not because of Jeanne's desolation that the king desired to marry her. She was only a glove to fling down in the face of the emperor, merely a note of defiance to sound in his hearing. She was a pledge to the Netherlands and to the Lutherans, who were favored and sheltered by the Duke of Cleve. The little princess must not expect the privileges of a woman. Jeanne could not resign herself to this political necessity. Her father dared not, her mother would not help her. So taking her case into her own defense, she appealed herself to the uncle whose favorite she was, and whom she knew more nearly than either parent. Having seen the Duke of Cleve, she felt she could never love him. She besought her kind uncle not to press the marriage. Francis was very wroth at this questioning of his decision. He imagined, perhaps, that the king of Navarre had urged his little daughter to revolt. His anger came to Margaret's ears. 
alarmed and horrified at jeanne's indiscretion she wrote to intercede for her rash little daughter but says margaret in a later letter to the king if the said duke of cleves had been to you all that he ought and that i desired i would never have spoken against him we would rather have seen our daughter die as she told us she should do then we would have stayed her from going to the place where i deemed she could do you a service this is no court parlance margaret considered that the noblest lot on earth was to live or die for her brother the king jeanne's revolt her claims for independence filled margaret with something akin to disdain and indignation she had no pity for the strange proud little girl who forsaken by father and mother beaten and coerced still declared in her weak childish treble that she would never love the duke of cleves her brother was margaret's religion and jeanne's determination seemed to her as impious as it was disobedient saint felicitas might have felt the same had one of her children refused to die for the cross she was resolved that her daughter should not fail the king in his need indignant that her daughter hers should shrink from so honourable a sacrifice she was determined to subdue that uncompromising and stubborn spirit indignant and with the despotic anger of the worshipper whose idol is outraged but jeanne was no silent martyr she was a decided brusque and valiant nature very french in type under the exterior of a charming and espiegle brunette she concealed an immense resolution the day before her betrothal to the german duke she called the three principal officers of her household into her presence and bade them witness her protestation she then read aloud i jeanne of navarre continuing the protest i have made and in which i persist say and declare and protest again before these present that the marriage to be made between me and the duke of cleves is against my will that i never have consented to it and never will consent and that whatever i may do or say hereafter wherefrom one may argue my consent it will be done by force against my will and desire and through fear of the king as of the king my father and of the queen my mother who has threatened me and has had me whipped by my governess the wife of the bailiff of caen and several times my governess has exhorted me by the command of the queen my mother threatening me that should i not do in the matter of this marriage all that the king of france requires and should i not consent i shall be so flogged and so maltreated that i shall die of it and that i shall be the cause of the ruin and destruction of my father my mother and all their house and all this has put me in such fear especially the destruction of my said father and mother that i know of no one who can succour me but god seeing that my father and my mother have forsaken me and these know well what i have said to them and that i can never love the duke of cleves and that i will none of him for i protest that should it come to pass that i be affianced or married to the duke of cleves in any sort or manner that may come about it will be and will have been against my heart and will and he shall never be my husband and never will i hold him for such and the said marriage shall be null and i call god and you to witness that you sign with me my protestation and recognize the force the violence and constraint which is used toward me in the matter of this marriage jeanne de navarre jeanne d'arras france navarro arnold duquesne there is no cause without its martyrs little jeanne sorely against her will was now to be tied to the rock the dragon was invited to come and take her a heavy german dragon growling in uncomprehended and barbaric jargon jeanne regarded him with loathing and aversion but no perseus appeared jeanne was sent to her mother at alencon and the duke of cleves followed her there to jeanne young high-spirited brilliant made by her confined and dreary childhood only the more eager for splendour and for paris 
it appeared a cruel lot to wed this german duke twelve years older than herself whose father was a madman whose manners disgusted her whose tongue she could not understand her mother had no sympathy with this aversion remembering her own first marriage she did not think her daughter unfortunate margaret appears to have liked the duke of cleve and he was at least an earnest against the emperor he was gallant in battle wealthy tolerant and a protector of the oppressed above all he could serve her brother francis she had small pity for jeanne nevertheless having gained considerable influence over duke william she managed to ease her little daughter of the most intolerable portion of her burden she induced the duke out of consideration to the childish age and fragile health of jeanne to submit to a purely formal marriage and then to return to germany leaving his little bride with her parents for at least another year even this respite did not appease jeanne the day after her betrothal she signed another protest at last the king became impatient he sent a peremptory message to margaret requesting her to bring her daughter at once to chatelereau where the court had removed the meadows of chatelereau were overbuilt with palaces and arches made of greenery jousts and tourneys were held the whole day long at night they were continued by torchlight a thing which never yet had been seen in france nymphs dryads dwarfs knights and ladies arrayed after the fashion of amadis and la belle dame saint merci hermits in robes of green and grey velvet all manner of gay and strange maskers inhabited the palaces of boughs little jeanne herself on her wedding morning was clad so heavily in cloth of gold and silver so studded and heavy with gems that she could not walk under the weight of her finery the king himself was to have led her to the altar finding her so weak a brilliant thought struck him here in the face of france in the hearing of europe he would exalt the bride of the emperor's enemy at the expense of the dupe of the emperor the king called montmorency to him he told the constable to pick up the little girl and carry her on his shoulders into the church montmorency dared not disobey the court looked on and marvelled indeed it was a strange sight that pale childish figure stiff with gold and laden with gems like some barbaric idol and the constable of france the highest dignitary of the realm turned into a porter for a tired child montmorency understood the insult he was angry and in sore despite he knew that he served as a spectacle to all as he walked in the triumph of his enemies my day is done he began to murmur good-bye to it i say but the queen of navarre was glad and whispered to those near to her that man tried to ruin me with the king and now he serves to carry my daughter to church jeanne was married then and there among all those whispers of envy hatred and uncharitableness married among the splendour that a country grown to pay for the duke of cleve at once retired to germany and the little bride set out for pau with her parents the jealousy of francis had not hitherto allowed her to visit her dominions but now the infant of spain could not marry her on the last day of the festivities the king sent for montmorency and dismissed him from his favour the emperor was defied End of section fifteen section sixteen of margaret of angouleme queen of navarre by agnes mary francis robinson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter twelve a league with soliman fifteen forty one to fifteen forty three francis as we have said was now resolved to win back his old allies to disclose his real relations with the emperor for the venetian embassy the king selected cesare di fregoso a son of the doge of genoa for constantinople antonio rincon a man of profound insight one of the few who could answer the question of the east 
as far as venice they were to travel together then rincon should proceed alone to the court of soliman the two ambassadors journeyed through piedmont towards the po for owing to the heaviness and corpulence of rincon they had resolved to take boat close to turin and do as much as possible of their journey by water on the first of july fifteen forty one they reached rivoli where they were met by messengers who besought them to halt for news had come to the ears of du Bellay, which it behooved them to learn before they left the town at midnight du Bellay himself arrived he assured the ambassadors that he had discovered a plot on the part of del guasto and the emperor to waylay their boat murder them and steal their despatches but fregoso laughed at this alarm he had fought against del guasto in honourable warfare and did not believe a great captain would stoop to such a deed rincon did not like to hang back alone moreover the corpulent ambassador dreaded the long journey on horseback which du Bellay advised he therefore let fregoso laugh his natural fears to scorn and they departed by water a more easy way says du Bellay, if less sure the next day a second messenger overtook the ambassadors by him du Bellay sent them accurate details of the ambush laid for them beseeching them to return or at least to send by courier their dispatches back to rivoli whence he du Bellay, would have them safely forwarded to venice either through shame or false confidence the ambassadors determined to proceed but recognizing that they had no right to imperil the safety of their message they sent the dispatches back to du Bellay. then urging their oarsmen to make haste they were rowed down the river all the night passing casale without any risk they were now within a few miles of pavia but a little farther down at a place called cantalupo a boat full of armed men suddenly boarded them murdered the wise rincon and the brave fregoso took the oarsmen and threw them into the dungeons of pavia thus it was supposed the fate of the ambassadors would remain shrouded in mystery but a second boat conveying the attendants of rincon and fregoso escaped from the ambush rowing swiftly to the bank the servants escaped ashore and fled into the woods and thence back to du Bellay at rivoli du Bellay hushed the matter up until he discovered the prison of the oarsmen who had witnessed the actual murder this at last coming to his ears he had the bars of their windows silently filed at night they escaped and having finally all the witnesses in his hands du Bellay turned on del guasto and accused him and his master of the crime the guilt was proved and spread horror throughout europe i cannot murder ambassadors like your master cried francis to the ambassador of spain and venice which could not execute the emperor or his governor insisted on the death of the assassins in their employ so rincon and fragoso were avenged charles v was deeply vexed not by the discovery of the murder but by his failure to secure the dispatches he however did what he could inventing false papers and spreading abroad a rumour that francis had offered germany as a prize to the turk in reward for soliman's help against the empire it is says margaret with bitter resignation only another of his accustomed lies but the lie did harm to france with credulous germany at this moment francis might opportunely have avenged himself on charles the little town of morano on the adriatic offered itself to the french king the town was small but the situation was invaluable planted between italy and austria opposite venice and neighbouring the east morano would have been a hand at the throat of the empire and a hand stretched out to the allies of france du Bellay strongly urged francis to take possession at once he did indeed put some few soldiers in it but ever hesitating the french king vacillated and shrank from offending charles so openly before this decision was taken venice had bought the little place francis had done much to estrange soliman he had as yet given no pledge of his good faith had he been able to point to murano the turk might have believed him as it was soliman felt an immense contempt 
for his credulous and vacillating ally when captain paulin brought at length the long-delayed despatches soliman refused to admit him to his presence paulin or paulino was a man of low origin but shrewd talent and plausible address he succeeded at last in gaining the ear of soliman the turk promised at length to renew his alliance and to send next year should the king require it an ottoman fleet to the aid of france but his faith in francis was destroyed meanwhile at home the king at last awakened was doing his best to regain his ground with the german lutherans but the emperor's lie fought hard against him and the news of the recently concluded alliance with the port did him harm with the league germany for the turks the superstitious germans heard under the promises and advances of the king all that francis could do was by tolerance at home to give as it were a new guarantee to the lutherans abroad and his clemency to the rebellious huguenot of la rochelle served in some sort as a guarantee of his good faith the court was now all for tolerance and the new ideas the psalms of david in marot's version were set to all the popular vaudevilles or to airs composed for them at court for one the dauphin himself wrote the music every one had an air a psalm and a text of his own ville madon margaret's envoy marvelled to find the gay court of fontainebleau thus out nerac nerac the cardinal de tournon looked on aghast he might have spared his fears this lutheranism had no roots it was but a demonstration against catholic spain against the convictions of the emperor charles appears to have understood the matter better he also determined to have a device and sent to clement marot begging him to translate for him the psalm confite mini domino if the duel between france and the empire was to be fought with psalms charles would not neglect his weapons but charles took a surer means to outwit his adversary francis must not be permitted to throw his clemency and tolerance like dust into german eyes convoking a diet at spears the emperor bid him look around and observe the deeds of this king so clement in words in the harbour at marseilles a turkish fleet rode at anchor let them ask themselves what convictions inspired this psalm-singing monarch he was ready to sacrifice st peter and luther alike to mohammed germany listened the emperor's speech with its caustic sarcasm could not be refuted it was almost a truth for the turk had revenged on francis his many vacillations and infidelities soliman had indeed sent the promised fleet for the turk keeps his word but the fleet was composed of algerian pirate ships and their admiral was the dreaded barbarossa such aid did francis more harm than good true the algerian pirates were brave and hardy they filled marseilles with trade and with gold but they were lawless and insatiable from provence itself they kidnapped boys and girls for the harems of constantinople when the fleet of francis and the fleet of barbarossa sailed side by side to the bombardment of nice the germans remembered that old lie of charles germany for the turks they said to themselves and forgetting a hundred cruelties and persecutions they rallied round the imperial standard the horror of germany for france infected the german duke of cleves horror of france and fear of the emperor he had fought so valiantly for francis that charles in his anger had sworn not to leave the duke an inch of his dominions the duke fought well but at last the growing contagion seized upon him he threw down his arms and sued for forgiveness promising to annul his alliance with the valois jeanne sore at heart was already travelling to the frontier to be given up to her abhorred bridegroom when this news reached her it appeared impossible of his own accord the dragon had renounced andromeda vilain et ton femme cries margaret indignant thinking of her brother betrayed but jeanne is happier than ever she had hoped to be again they apply to the pope to dissolve the marriage 
a worse blow struck francis on the eleventh of february of this year fifteen forty three when the emperor concluded an alliance with henry of england france was now indeed alone the turkish admiral had sailed from the coasts of france where there was no enemy to harass he had promised to return in case of need but francis hesitated to call back so redoubtable an ally the lutherans of germany and the protestants of england were fighting against him under his enemy's standard the emperor was encamped in champagne the king of england was before boulogne francis at this time was seriously ill he could not command his army tormented by internal wounds oppressed by melancholy he could neither act nor advise the queen agonized by this war between husband and brother was sick unto death there was indeed an air of joy in the court of the dauphin but in the retinue of the king's favorite son there was a sense of failure and disappointment in january catherine de medici had brought into the world a sickly and miserable son the child could scarcely breathe he was so weak his body was covered with livid spots a serious obstruction in his head would always prevent him from speaking plainly yet such as he was he and no longer charles of orleans was the heir of france End of section sixteen Section 17 of Margaret of Angoulême, Queen of Navarre, by Agnes Mary Frances Robinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 13. The Heptameron. Section 1. 1544. Part 1. While wars and rumors of wars invaded this distracted land of France, the king had lost his genius for battle and adventure a restless invalid prematurely old he was unable to control the fortunes of his kingdom the hero of marignano was no more nor the chivalric captive of pavia whose noble and courtly demeanour in misfortune had been the ideal of europe in their stead reigned this sad and superannuated man consumed by his abscess tormented with unrest his kingdom ravaged by his enemies his church bewildered by heresy and fanatic suspicion his court split up into cliques and angry rivalries himself the disregarded head of a waning faction no one at the louvre could charm away the melancholy of the unhappy king the proud and ardent queen too long insulted was only nominally a member of her husband's court shut in her own apartments with her spanish suite her priests and her confessor she made of her presence chamber a little spain decorous and fanatic in which she strove to forget this court of france where god knows how i am treated and the manner in which the king has used me worn by disappointment and anxiety she had become a nervous delicate and melancholy woman hopelessly estranged from her frivolous husband madame d'etampes who for so many years had taken her place and usurped her duties was now too anxious on her own behalf to care to soothe the trouble of the king should francis die what would become of her who for so long so wantonly had provoked the anger and hate of the dauphin and of his stately diana what lurid clouds would not cover her when that pale crescent moon had filled its orb the pretty Huguenot Duchess was in a very fever of anxiety and suspicion. What was the melancholy of Francis to her own? Nor were the children of the king of much avail. Henry was of the opposite faction. He looked sternly and coldly on the frivolities of his father. The Duke of Orléans, riotous, gallant, high-spirited, the favorite child of Francis, was of little use in so sorrowful a sick chamber. Madeleine was dead studious marguerite was too young too inexperienced to help she lived for the most in the decorous court of the queen apart from the dying licentious old king the selfish imperious mistress the riotous young duke of orleans and catherine de medici who had courted francis in order to discover his secrets 
had not the art to cure a distempered soul. The king was virtually alone in his melancholy and his suspicion. Then the double war broke out with Charles V and with Henry of England. Queen Leonor, never hardened to the constant war between her husband and her brother, fell ill of a nervous fever from grief and distraction. The two young princes went to the war. The court was so pervaded by desolating anxiety that Francis, unable any longer to endure his distress alone, summoned his sister from Alençon to Paris. Margaret had met her brother in April at her castle of Alençon, and had spent some time in his company while he directed the arrangements for the campaign in the north. She was therefore aware of the further change that his sickness had worked in him but in April she had still been able to interest him in projects of war and of state. In April she still had held a brief for England. She still had hoped to gain Henry and detach him from the emperor. In July she found him at war with both alike, confined to his room, without energy or impulse or resource, the miserable debris of a king. Her cheerful ardor infused new life into Francis, she roused him from his nerveless melancholy and made him show himself to the anxious burghers of Paris. She restored him as far as possible to his legitimate place as head of the state. She prayed with him and for him, exerting her benign and tolerant spirit to direct him into the way of peace, and amid these more serious endeavors she did not forget to amuse. She knew that the most grievous enemy of her brother was neither the Emperor Charles nor Henry of England, but the hypochondriac melancholy which hung like a cloud over his senses. She sang to him the psalms of her protégé, Clément Marot. She read to him the novels of Boccaccio, recently translated by another of her gentlemen-in-waiting, Antoine Le Masson, under her own direction, and these novels became at once as great a fashion at court as the Psalms of Marot had been a year or two before. For a few hours they even chased away the pain and depression of the king. In this book, says the preface to the Heptameron, so great a delight was taken by the most Christian king, Francis, first of the name, by my lord Dauphin, Madame the Dauphiness, and Madame Marguerite, that if Boccaccio from the place where he was could have heard their voices, he would have been brought to life again by the praise of such as they. Soon, however, Margaret was compelled to leave her brother. Peace was arranged with Charles V on what appeared to be favorable terms. Queen Leonor began to recover from her fever and was able to return to court. Notwithstanding the anger of the Dauphin at the sudden termination of a war which he had hoped to lead to a more glorious end, Francis I was manifestly content. By deserting his ally, Solomon of Turkey, by revoking his protection from the Lutherans, by giving his promise to Charles V to crush out heresy and subdue the Turks, Francis had secured a splendid inheritance for his favorite son. He had sold his soul for an abundant mess of pottage. Margaret, the champion of the Huguenots should have shrunk from an advantage secured by so infamous a desertion. But no, she was carried away by that fatal idolatry for her brother which deprived her of judgment when he was at the bar. Her brother was pleased, was better, was almost happy, and Margaret exults over the peace between Le Lys et La Pomeronde. As soon as the peace of Crepy was arranged, the king left Paris to hunt in his forests at Romorantin, impelled by that nervous restlessness which hurried him continually from place to place. And Margaret returned to her duchy of Alençon to set her affairs in order there. She was glad to leave her brother in a less miserable mind, yet keen enough to see that his cure was as yet but half begun. He must still be amused, roused, entertained, the oncoming of melancholy must incessantly be watched, and then it entered into Margaret's eager brain to compose another book, like those novels of Boccaccio, which had delighted him so much. To write a Decameron herself, in which the adventures should belong to people at the court of the king, or at the least of his time and country. On her frequent journeys from place to place, 
she wrote these novels as the horses slowly jogged along with her great curtained litter my grandmother holding the inkhorn for her says brantome in his memoir and as she first began to write these stories in that city of alencon where she had spent unwillingly so much of her youth old memories thronged her mind and many of the adventures of the heptameron take place in alencon always in the time of the last duke charles it has been the fashion hitherto to date the heptameron too early miss freer margaret's principal biographer in england misled perhaps by the constant occurrence of the words alencon and argentin and yet more by an eager desire to do the best for her favourite has placed the heptameron in margaret's thoughtless youth but after all the heptameron does not need our excuses for its thoughtlessness it is gross but not so gross as the time it is worldly and amorous but less so than the court on the whole the remarkable thing about it is the ideal of religion and virtue which it still lifts however feebly in opposition to the gay society for which it was written we can see that margaret has no natural distaste for the freedom of manners which she has schooled herself to condemn it is only immorality that meets the censure of oisille never indecency her blame is an affair of the conscience not of the temperament but even if the book did not painfully attain to virtue did not attempt to teach a lesson were there no further intention in it than to amuse with questionable stories none the less it is plain that margaret wrote the book not in her youth but in her ripe maturity it is no fault of youthful folly as i hope to prove on looking closer it is perhaps no fault at all at the best and the worst it remains the pathetic endeavour of a devoted sister to beguile the tedium of her dying brother by the only sort of stories he will listen to while at the same time she infuses by a strange incessant twisting of the facts a lesson of trust in god and in virtue while she attempts to advocate tolerance to condemn a corrupted church that these morals follow very oddly on the gross adventures of the heptameron must certainly be conceded for it is not always easy both to point a moral and adorn a tale and with margaret the two intentions are equally strong and equally manifest still though often perverse grotesque or profane throughout these stories the moral the ideal is evident it is not difficult to determine the date of the heptameron in almost every novel of the series we find allusions to events which did not take place till margaret was certainly middle-aged to give a few of these the regency of madame fifteen twenty four to fifteen twenty six is referred to in one of the novels both bonnevet and the duke of alencon are always spoken of as dead fifteen twenty five the league of cambrai fifteen twenty nine gives rise to one adventure and in the second story we hear of the little prince jean of navarre who died in fifteen thirty the descent of charles v into provence is the occasion of another fifteen thirty six the murder of alessandro de medici by his cousin lorenzaccio in fifteen thirty seven is related in the twelfth novel more than once a reference is made to the sudden death of the dauphin francois in fifteen thirty six and henry and catherine are invariably called monsieur le dauphin and madame la dauphine the armistice of nice fifteen thirty eight or more probably that of crespi fifteen forty four is alluded to in the tenth novel in the twenty-fifth we hear the unedifying story of the love of francis for la belle ferronniere fifteen thirty nine the novels toward the end were evidently written later than the introduction which must have been composed in fifteen forty four because the death of the duke of orleans fifteen forty five is spoken of in one and the marriage of the little princess jeanne to monsieur de vendome which occurred in fifteen forty eight is the subject of another margaret died in fifteen forty nine the dates given above will prove abundantly that these novels cannot have been the work of margaret's girlhood 
it is clear to me that the heptameron was composed from 1544 till the autumn of 1548. It is, of course, very likely that Margaret had already in her portfolio several isolated stories and adventures, for storytelling was the fashion of the time, and she is spoken of as excelling in the accomplishment. But as a whole, the book began most probably in 1544. In the introduction, which presents to us the principal personages of the work, the following passage occurs. I believe there is no one among you who has not read the hundred novels of Jean Bocasse, recently translated from Italian into French, 1543, in which the most Christian King Francis, first of the name, Monseigneur le Dauphin, Madame la Dauphine, and Madame Marguerite, have taken such delight that the two last-mentioned ladies would fain have done as much themselves and many others of the court deliberately to do as much, only in one thing different from Bocas, that they would write no novel that was not veritable history. And with Monseigneur le Dauphin with them, and as many as would make ten persons in all whom they thought worthy to tell such stories, they concluded each to write ten, but they would not admit students and men of letters to their number, for Monseigneur le Dauphin did not wish that their art should be mingled with this sport. Also he feared that the beauties of rhetoric might do wrong to some portion of the veritable story. But the great affairs that since then have happened to the king, the double invasion, 1543 to 1544, also the peace between him and the king of England, this was not signed and ratified until 1546, but serious hostility ceased after the peace of Crespi in September 1544. This earlier date must be meant, since no allusion is made to the death of the Duke of Orléans in 1545, and the confinement of Madame la Dauphine, January 20th, 1544, with many other things sufficiently important to engross the court, have caused this enterprise to fall into oblivion. I believe that a comparison of the dates cited here and a little consideration of the events of the time will convince my readers that in her solitary state at Alençon in 1544 and in her frequent journeys about the duchy, Margaret began the book of which she meant to make a modern Decameron, but which her untimely death cut short before the end. The mechanism of her stories is clearly borrowed from Boccaccio and Castiglione. A company of ladies and gentlemen of good family have been spending the autumn at the Pyrenean Baths. Being surprised by grievous floods and a heavy deluge of rain, the visitors have left the baths and set out for their homes. But the dangers of travel from the swollen rivers, from wild beasts and yet more savage robbers have overtaken many by the way, so that of all that society only ten find refuge, safe and sound, in the friendly abbey of saint Savin. Here they must wait until the floods subside, and to while away the tedium of their imprisonment they tell true adventures to each other every afternoon from the midday dinner till the hour of vespers. The little company is composed of five noble gentlemen and five ladies. The first to arrive is an elderly and pious widow, Damoisie, who has lost in the confusion her gentleman-in-waiting, named Simonto, once the très affectueux serviteur of Madame Parlamente, a spirited but pious woman of the world, never lazy nor melancholy, who has also taken refuge at saint Savin with her churlish husband, Ircan. She, in her turn, is surprised to meet in this place of refuge her platonic lover, Dagoussin, a most devoted admirer, who would rather die than do aught to hurt the conscience of his lady. Dagoussin has escaped from the floods with his friend, Safredon, a brilliant young scapegrace, wild and reckless, but not unlovable, who is under the charm of Longarine, a tender-hearted, timid creature whose husband has been slain by robbers in escaping from the flood. The shadow of her sudden loss still overhangs her delicate nature. These fugitives are joined by two young unmarried ladies, a Marsuite, a quiet, somewhat jealous-tempered young woman with a turn for sentiment, 
ah sire you know not what a heartbreak comes from unrequited love and nomerfide a scatter-brained high-spirited girl the youngest and maddest of us all nor is the number yet complete two bachelors Gebron, a worthy steady gentleman and the missing simonto a proficient in badinage who is always complaining of the ladies though he looks so merry and in such good condition have escaped with difficulty from the swollen river and reached the abbey at last thus bringing the number of the rescued to the necessary ten these fugitives from the floods being safely arrived at st savin consider how they shall pass their time they must wait there about a fortnight while the bridges are repaired and the waters subside to live a fortnight without pastime is an insupportable idea to lament their dead friends and perished servants would be a waste of time ought they not rather enjoy inestimable to praise the creator who contenting himself with the servitors has saved the masters and the mistresses the mere loss of servants as a marsuit remarks with a lingering touch of medievalism the death of servants should not throw one into despair they are so easily replaced longarine the tender-hearted is a little shocked at this philosophy but she too admits that a pastime is necessary else remembering our losses we might become wearisome and that is an incurable malady as for the madcap nomerfide she declares that were she a single day without amusement she would be found dead in the morning to avert so doleful a catastrophe hircan and all the gentlemen beseech madame oisy as the eldest of the party to discover some pastime which without hurting the soul may be pleasing to the body in this character of madame oisy it is clear that the queen of navarre has meant to draw her own likeness margaret in 1544 was 52 years of age and loved to speak of herself as older than she was the reader is already acquainted with her leaning towards mystical piety and her strong sense of the necessity for reforming the catholic church with all her piety she is however above all things a woman of the great world indulgent to the laxities of others though more severe towards herself it is true that oisy is a widow margaret a wife and a mother but alone in her castle of alencon with her young husband so long away in the south with her only child so seldom seen bred and reared so far from her care margaret may well have portrayed herself as one who has outlived the dearest interests of life her customary dress of sober black with the short mantle fastened by pins in front with the white chemisette gathered high at the throat and the low french hood covering the hair is more like mourning garb than royal splendor a widow's dress is her most natural disguise madame oisy is a virtuous widow of good birth she is old and full of experience herself all piety and virtue and even an adherent of the severe and scriptural religion of geneva she is none the less disposed to the conventional gallantry of the time the stories of her companions sometimes draw from her a mild remonstrance but she never forbids their recital she possesses indeed quite a singular talent for drawing a pious conclusion from the loosest adventure as all examples of human frailty go to prove that virtue and strength should be sought in heaven and not on earth oisy discovers an occasion for piety even in boccaccio and sometimes the use she makes of her scriptural knowledge is very strange indeed a story of loveless faithless marriage suggests the conclusion that st paul wills not for married people to love each other much for if our hearts be bound by an earthly affection we are so much the farther from grace and in another adventure where a good wife laughs at her husband's infidelity oisy remarks she was not one of those against whom our saviour speaks saying we have mourned and ye have not wept we have piped and ye did not dance for when her husband was sick she wept and when he was merry she laughed so all good women should share in their husband's good and evil 
joy or sorrow and serve him as the church serves jesus christ this quotation as a quotation might be taken as a caustic piece of sarcasm but the peculiarity of the heptameron is its union of an ideal of chivalry honour and religion with an entire absence of the moral sense piety is an affair of the thoughts the opinions the ideas possibly a matter for one's own personal life and soul that it should attempt to regulate the lives of others would be to fall into the deadly sin of pride mystical as margaret ever is she is naturally lenient to the grosser sins for all her esoteric dogmas go to prove firstly that the sins of the body are of small account compared with sins of the soul such as pride and deadness of spirit and secondly that the soul exists only in its relations to the idea of god and that it has no duties and no relations to the external world the militant and responsible side of virtue is dead in such a soul end of section seventeen section eighteen of margaret of angouleme queen of navarre by agnes mary francis robinson this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter thirteen. The Heptameron one fifteen forty four part two. Of the subjective idealist romantic side of virtue, the Heptameron affords many an example, oddly twisted through a tangle of worldliness, gallantry, and gross indecency. Oisille always ranges herself on the side of constancy and chivalry against Hircan and Safradon, who are supporters of the loose old adage that nous sommes faits, beaux fils sans doute, tout pour tous et tous pour toutes. She will not allow them with impunity to call a constant, chaste, unfortunate love madness and folly. Do you call it folly, she cries, to love honestly in youth and then to turn that affection to the love of God? and she reprimands the arrogant licentiousness of these gay youths, recommending to them the older-fashioned ideal of reverence and humility on the part of the lover. In a fine passage, she defends these virtues against Hircan, who, with a sneer, declares that chastity is not only praiseworthy, it is even miraculous. It is no miracle, replies Oisille. Not, says Hircan, to those who are already angelized. Nay, answers Oisille, I do not only speak of those who by the grace of God are quite transformed in him, but of the coarsest, rudest spirits one may see here below in the world of men, and if you choose you may discover those who have so set their heart and affection on finding the perfection of science that they have not only forgotten the pleasures of the flesh, but even its necessities, even eating and drinking, for as much as the soul penetrates within the body, by so much the flesh becomes insensible. Thus it happens that those who love beautiful, honest, and virtuous women have no grosser desire than to look on them and to hear them speak, and those who have no experience of these delights are the carnally minded who too closely wrapped in their flesh cannot say whether they have souls or no but when the body is subject to the spirit it becomes insensible. And I have known a gentleman who loved his lady so unusually that among all his companions he alone was able to hold a lighted candle in his naked fingers looking at this lady until the flames burned him to the bone. He even said that it did not hurt him at all. She is the champion not only of ideal love, but of the sentiment of pity, of consideration for the poor. More than once her stories turn on virtue that shines the brighter in a humble setting, for she declares, The graces of God are not given to men for their noble birth, neither for their riches, but as it pleases his mercy, for he is no respecter of persons. He elects whom he will, and his elect honor him with virtue and crown him with glory, and often he elects the lowly of the earth to the confusion of those whom the world holds in honour, for he saith, Let us not rejoice in our own righteousness, 
but rather that our names are written in the book of life so much for the ideal of the heptameron yet let us add there is one hero one living earthly hero who embodies all oisille's conceptions of chivalry of courage justice and mercy to this avatar of honour almost every page refers the gaiety and brilliance of his youth the splendour of his court his magnanimity his courage are constantly recorded his amours and their adventures are fit themes for the pious oisille and the virtuous parlement his address and royal qualities are perpetually praised it is king francis who is not only the occasion but the hero of the heptameron oisille in particular has so great an admiration for this prince that she finds noble in him the very acts she would have blamed with biting wit in saffredon with not a word does she condemn the wildest of his adventures that he should betray his host and unwittingly persuade a pious friar to forward an illicit love affair all this is but a proof of his savoir faire she immensely admires the piety that prompts him to say his prayers in church on his return from an intrigue with the wife of his friend she the patroness of ideal goodness cannot find any praise for an honest young girl who refuses the illegal love of the king it is the impudence and not the virtue of such a refusal that amazes her in her book as in her life margaret's idolatry for her brother paralyzes her judgment and her conscience but though she cannot judge him margaret would fain persuade him she is too timid too submissive to reproach him for the tremendous guilt of the vaudois massacres she knows that women are smothered brave men foully murdered for holding opinions no more heretical than her own and though here and there she intercedes for some special victim she dares not judge she dares not condemn she dares not rush in and stay the ruining arm of the king but with the timid fawning of a hound upon its angry master she tries to reconcile him to her belief again timorously she plucks at his sleeve she reminds him that this faith he punishes is her own even as he strikes and slays she tells him her simple tale and trusts that he will catch the moral it is all the interference that she dares so throughout this heptameron of hers which aims above all things at beguiling the melancholy of francis we take note of a secondary aim a purpose little less urgent it is to point out the corruption of the church the immorality of the convents and monasteries the impudent debauchery of the secular confessors the low ignorant baseness of the wandering franciscan friars she tries to show how from the scriptures alone and not from the dogmas of a church intent on temporal power should the spiritual rules of the christian life be framed she shows the inadequate repentance of those who buy a mass to condone a crime thoughts before deeds souls before bodies faith before works this is her constant lesson coming strangely enough from her frank and gallic mouth and again and again explicitly and by implication she distinguishes the purer thoughts the cleaner lives of those who have left all to follow these doctrines and who are they she will not answer that let the king think a moment they are lefebvre the dispossessed roussel farel calvin the exiled berquin lecourt and all the host of those who have gone up to heaven in a chariot of fire they are the poor vaudois who are dying by scores and by hundreds at the king's command this is her second aim to scathe and expose to soften and persuade and after every bitter phrase every flash of irony we can imagine the pause the anxious thought will the king be the headsman of such bitters as these but alas as is naturally the fate of a lesson so subtly so indirectly conveyed francis laughed at the fable and did not heed the moral oisille is an excellent mistress of the ceremonies it is a pity adds the court that she is taken with these new ideas and francis laughs and says she loves me too well to adopt a religion that would prejudice my estate 
with no better success than this madame oisille also preaches to her companions she induces them to read the bible they will do anything to gratify so charming a lady so before dinner they study the scriptures at her side after dinner not to be outdone in complaisance oisille listens to their boccaccian stories and she listens without shame and without regret she and her listeners are equally ignorant that their novels leave anything to be desired for madame oisille with her chivalric ideal is no more fastidious than they but we have made too long a digression from the heptameron itself hircan and his friends desiring as i have told that madame oisille should find them a suitable pastime oisille replies in a speech of real beauty my children this is a difficult thing that you ask of me to teach you a pastime that can deliver you from your troubles for having sought such a remedy all my life i have never found but one and this is the reading of the holy scriptures in which is found the true and perfect joy of the spirit and from which proceed health and rest for the flesh and if you ask me to tell you the receipt which keeps me so joyous and so healthy in my age it is that as soon as i arise in the morning i take the holy scriptures and read therein seeing and contemplating the will of god who sent his son for our sake into the world to announce his holy word and glad tidings whereby he promises remission from our sins and the full discharge of all our debts by the gift of his love his passion and his martyrdom the thought of this so fills me with delight that i take up my psalter and as humbly as i can i sing in my heart and say with my mouth the beautiful canticles and psalms which the spirit of god composed in the heart of david and of other writers and the contentment that i find therein so eases me that all the evils which my days may bring appear to me as benedictions seeing that in faith i keep in my heart even him who hath borne them all for me likewise before supper-time i retire and pasture my soul in some holy lesson and then at night i recollect my doings of the day and ask forgiveness for my faults and praise god for his mercies and in his love and fear and peace i take my rest assured against all evils there my children you behold the pastime which for long enough has sufficed me who having questioned all things have found in none of them contentment for the spirit haply if every morning you would read the scriptures for an hour and afterwards say your prayers devoutly during mass you will find in this desert the beauty which is in every place for he who knows god sees all things fair in him and afar from him there is but ugliness but this proposal fills hircan and the others with dismay imagine no merfide who would die without a pastime and longarine who is afraid to sorrow for her husband lest she should ruin her manners imagine the dashing saffredon the cynical hircan the sentimental simonto giving a fortnight to devout meditation hircan ventures to remonstrate he bids us remember that they are not yet so mortified but that they need some amusement and corporal exercise they are willing to study the scriptures but at home the men have hunting and hawking the ladies their household their embroidery and music both have dances and honest amusements which make us forget a thousand foolish thoughts in addition to devotion they must have something which shall take the place of all this it is then that parlement who takes a sort of second lead in ruling the little society suggests that they should imitate the novels of boccaccio and a sort of compromise is finally adopted by which the ladies and gentlemen agree to spend their forenoons in prayer and their afternoons in pastime we can easily imagine that fair and gallant company mustering in the pleasant warmth of the autumn noonday along the road that leads from the convent to the pleasant meadow where they hold their sessions madame oisille all in white and sober black stands out conspicuously from the knot of gaily blended colours her dress we may fancy to be the same that the queen of navarre wears in the illustrations to la coche the others are clad after the pattern of the sisters and brothers of the abbey of Talima. the men wear close beards and moustaches their hair clipped very short and covered with a small low cap of black velvet 
from which toward the front a white plume of marabou feathers starts their long stockings are white or black crimson or scarlet their slashed trunk hose are of the same colours or of a varying and harmonious shade they wear slashed and embroidered pourpoint in cloth of gold or silver damask satin or velvet their short cloaks are richly furred and guarded at his side each man carries a handsome sword with a gilded hilt and a sheath the same colour as his hose the ladies are yet more magnificent orange tawny blue ash grey yellow white or crimson are their colours velvet or silver taffeta embroidered is their favourite wear their skirts are distended to the shape of an inverted funnel their stockings are scarlet or flame-coloured their slashed shoes of crimson and violet velvet they have mantles of taffeta furred with marten lynx or genet on their heads they wear low french hoods small caps edged with goldsmith's work or gold nets with pearls at the angles a gold chain hangs from the girdle pomanders and scent bottles seals and keys dangle from it and every lady has a feather fan after the pattern of queen leonore's with a little mirror at the back they walk slowly for the ladies have high patents or chopin to keep their velvet shoes from the dust you cannot see their faces for they all wear little silken masks that shield their complexions from the noon their hands are hidden in rich embroidered gloves thus secured from the cold of the wind or scorch of the sun they walk along toward the fair green meadow if one should peer too close perhaps those splendid coloured garments would be seen to be stained with dust or rain to be frayed with travel if one should look too curiously one might see many a speck in the courtesy and honour of the men in the lovableness and spirit of the women yet from afar they look a happy and a pleasant company we would fain know more of them Oisy we know we knew her when she was young we have sympathized with her in good and evil fortune but who are these her fair and brilliant companions m genin would believe them the ladies and gentlemen in waiting at the magnanimous and cultured little court of nerac but if so we only know the portraits the originals are dead and forgotten the dust of oblivion is piled thick upon them i had hoped to discover here that courtly society whom margaret mentions in her preface those first would-be writers of the french decameron but even to suit so delightful a theory i could not identify the rude harsh savage yet half servile hircan with the musical cultured romantic dauphin henry clad always in the colours of his fair incarnate moon and passing his leisure in reading amadis how is it possible that in the brilliant quick act of parliament one should recognise catherine de medici plump thick-set bourgeoise with her conciliatory manners and servile grace no such a theory would cost too dear to maintain it one must rival the restorer of the apollo belvedere who having made his pair of feet too small scraped the ankles of the statue until they were slender enough to fit it is best to throw aside such ready-made restorations and then a sudden fancy shot across my mind true madame oisille is margaret of navarre but yet is it not possible as she sits in her gloomy room at argentan the room where she had often been unhappy in the good old days when she was so young as she sways in her litter along the straight dusty poplar bordered and familiar roads of alencon thinking how she should make this book that is to charm her brother may not a sudden vision of the old past years rise up before her eyes may not the contrast strike sharply on her then half in regret and half in pitiful memory may she not place beside this stately figure of herself grown old the slimmer swifter brighter figure of margaret d'alencon and marry this pious worldly brilliant parlement to hircan the moody churlish duke charles then by their side we can imagine to arise the tender loving gentle vision of philiberta of savoy and we behold the sweet and timid longarine with m franck i should give safredon to bonivet 
many another whom we knew not comes back to mind again and takes a place in her story lastly she creates le gentilhomme simonto obviously not quite the equal in rank of his associates who once long ago was parlement's très affectueux serviteur and in this neat merry half sentimental fellow a little sore at his jester's reputation we fancy that we see again the well-remembered form of clement marot of whose early death queen margaret must have heard in that very autumn of fifteen forty four end of section eighteen